I was recently invited to attend a retirement webinar with author Tom Hegna as the featured presenter. Overall, Mr. Hegna is an impressive speaker and he certainly has his presentation down pat. But several of his confident assertions, such as that there is only one optimal way to retire, got me thinking and worrying. Is his confidence justified or is it overconfidence? Are his retire happy recommendations fundamentally incomplete or mistaken? Or worse, is it just some sales pitch or scam as some articles might lead one to believe? In this video, I want to work towards an answer to some of these questions and along the way I'll probably ask a few more. But right off the bat, I want to give a few caveats and disclaimers. I am not a retirement expert. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not an economist. This video is intended for general informational or entertainment purposes only. I am simply thinking through these issues for myself, trying to figure out what Tom Hegna is saying and whether or not what he presents is a viable option. If you need actual financial advice, you need to consult an expert in your area. Hegna is billed as a financial expert, author, and speaker. His own About Me page describes him as an economist, author, and retirement expert. But in what sense is he an economist? Biographical snippets online reveal that he attended North Dakota State University and earned three majors, but does he have a degree in economics? I actually wrote to Hagen and asked him this question, and he responded by saying that he did, in fact, receive a BA degree in economics while he was at NDSU. And in addition, he points out that he actually publishes economic commentaries every year on YouTube. He was a former vice president at New York Life, life insurance company. But his main points were packaged for public consumption in his Don't Worry, Retire Happy in Seven Steps presentation. Now, this was picked up by public television, at least in several markets. I'm not sure if it aired nationally, but it did air in various places around the country, including in Minnesota and Wisconsin, and more significantly on KCET, which serves the greater Los Angeles area. Los Angeles, California is the second most populous city in the United States, so it's certainly true that he's reached a significant audience. Now, you need to consult Hegna's publications for the complete presentation, but his seven steps include getting the most from Social Security, the potential benefits of a hybrid retirement, and how to use your home's equity. He's targeting and discussing what he calls retirement optimality. He's going for the optimal retirement. And he wants to distinguish what is optimal from what is best. And he explicitly states optimal does not mean best. And this is fairly easy to give an illustration of. I mean, you could potentially envision putting all of your money into some obscure startup. And if that startup took off and became the next Amazon or Google or Netflix, then you might make a bundle and be set for the rest of your life. But this is, to say the least, a bit of a gamble. And it can hardly be said that this represents some sort of a plan or advice that you could give to other people. So he defines optimal this way. He says, quote, optimal simply means the best more often than anything else and that it will never be the worst. Now, it reminds me of a concept from game theory called the minimax. Roughly the idea there is, how can you maximize your gain, but at the same time minimize your loss? Hegna summarizes his main points in two statements. He says, retiring happy requires number one, securing guaranteed lifetime income, and number two, eliminating or minimizing what he calls longevity risk, the risk of living too long. Now, he talks about all kinds of things. He talks about bond ladders and investing in dividend paying stock companies, different ways of using life insurance, the importance potentially of safeguarding against a nursing home experience by having long long-term care insurance in your portfolio, the use of your home's equity, possibly involving some rental income from properties, putting your money in stocks, and so on. But if I had to boil the entire presentation down to a single word, it would be annuities. This whole presentation centrally revolves around annuities. And the reason for this is that annuities are one of three sources, not just for income, not just for lifetime income, but for what Hegner refers to as guaranteed lifetime income. The other two sources being employer pensions and government social security benefits. Hegna's approach is presented in several different books, one of which is titled Paychecks and Playchecks, and the title gives us an indication of where he's headed. For by paycheck, he means the income that you apportion to your needs, and by playcheck, he means the money you spend on the things that you want. I mean, basically. And according to Hegna's strategy, what you want to do is you want to calculate or estimate the amount of money that you absolutely need each month in retirement. And then what you want to do is you want to subtract the amount of pensions you have, subtract your Social Security, and then the difference is what you need to cover in an annuity. On Hegna's picture, annuities address both. They give you guaranteed income 
and they eliminate or minimize longevity risk. And he makes this point repeatedly. So annuities are not just for guaranteed income. They also take longevity risk off the table. This is something he thinks that other types of income producing asset like stocks or CDs or real estate simply cannot do. Now, here's the question. How can we begin to evaluate these claims? I mean, I'm not an economist. I am not a financial expert. Like I said, how can I begin to get a grasp on them? There are some potential pitfalls or traps. One thing I want to warn you against is taking seriously some kinds of rhetoric. Now, I'd like to map out what I take to be a few false trails. One potential pitfall is sometimes termed the genetic fallacy. The idea here is that you can somehow discredit something by pointing to its possibly unsavory origins. Now in the book, Attacking Faulty Reasoning, we have a pretty good illustration of this. The illustration is that of the wedding ring. And the arguer in this example basically says, how can you wear a wedding ring? Don't you realize that it originally symbolized ankle chains women were forced to wear to prevent them from running away from their husbands? The key thing that makes the genetic fallacy an error in reasoning is that the arguer neglects to pay attention to relevant differences and fails to assess a particular claim on its own own merits. In our case, a faulty argument might read like this. You're thinking of buying an annuity, are you? Well, don't you know that annuities are offered by life insurance companies? I can't believe you'd want to have anything to do with that sort of thing. Whether a particular financial vehicle or insurance product fits into a portfolio is going to depend on the particulars of the portfolio. It's going to depend on how that product functions, expected returns, and so on. The origin of annuities in general does not affect those kinds of considerations. And when you're comparing different products, the ratings of the various companies involved is going to matter quite a lot. A second false trail is a species of the so-called ad hominem fallacy. In this fallacy, someone attacks the arguer personally instead of assessing the argument itself on its own merits. So, for example, all life insurance agents are dishonest or biased salespeople. Tom Hegna is or was an insurance agent. Therefore, Tom Hegna is biased or dishonest. Now, you might think that this is rarely used or that I'm being unfair, but in fact, something similar was articulated to me by a representative of Fisher Investments when I called them asking if they had a reaction to Tom Hegna. Besides being informally fallacious, logically speaking, I also just thought it was poor form and not a bit self-defeating. For if the opinion of a life insurance agent is supposed to be biased, then it's hard for me to see why the opinion of an investment manager wouldn't be equally biased even if it's in a different direction. But at the end of the day, it might be a bit like asking the electric company what it thinks about the gas company's impact on the environment and vice versa. A related mistake might be an unjustified focus on Tom Hegna's background. So for example, Tom Hegna claims to be an economist, but a real economist has to have an advanced degree. Tom Hegna doesn't have advanced degrees, therefore he's not a real economist. I think both of these are false trails or bad thoughts, so to speak. Firstly, this is because Hegna's character is irrelevant. Remember, the ad hominem logical fallacy basically attacks the person's character, even though the character is irrelevant to whether or not not the claims are correct or incorrect. He could be a scoundrel and he could be right about annuities. His being a scoundrel or not has nothing to do with the correctness of his claim. And note, I'm not saying that he is a scoundrel, but I'm saying it's irrelevant. Number two, Hegna's background is even irrelevant. Now, this is a little bit harder for people to get their minds around sometimes. Stephen Gimbel, writing in an introduction to formal logic, reminds us, quote, arguments stand or fall on their own merits whose mouth the argument comes out of is irrelevant. The background of the speaker has nothing to do with the validity or soundness of an argument. Another thing I think to throw in here is that finance and economics are not obviously the same thing. It's not clear that economists are the only people who can have something relevant to say about retirement. Financial experts might also, and financial experts and economists, aren't necessarily the same thing. Tom Hegner has a number of designations, as is apparent from his About Me page on his website. He's designated as CLU, which is an abbreviation for Chartered Life Underwriter. This gives him an expertise in life insurance, estate planning, and business planning. The CHFC, or Chartered Financial Consultant, expanding his expertise in estate planning and adding in things like employee benefits planning. He's also a CASL, or a Chartered Advisor for Senior Living. He's got specialties in long-term care insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, risk and return associated with different types of securities, planning for retirement distributions, and also things like claiming Social Security. And the CASL, at least, is a fairly rigorous designation, according to Investopedia.
For number one, Hegna doesn't appear to have any obvious conflicts of interest. He says, quote, I don't sell annuities. I don't have any financial interest in the sale of annuities. Secondly, he arguably does know about economics. You can see his economic commentaries on YouTube, and he invites you to do so and says that they speak for themselves. And it's worth pointing out that other popular contributors to the economics conversation, such as the uneducated economists, don't have degrees and yet are able to say many useful things about economics. And number three, there is reason to think that he's really a nice, reliable guy. Once again, this is irrelevant to the actual argument, but I thought I would throw it in there. I did reach out to a number of these professors, and many of them gave him compliments. He's actually a really nice guy, according to Dr. Moshe Malevsky and Dr. Michael Fink said, Tom is a great presenter and a smart guy. Now, I should point out, though, that this actually sets the stage for a third possible false trail, and that is, it's conceivable that somebody might try to construct an argument in Tom Hegna's favor that is also fellatious. So, for example, Tom Hegna is smart and knowledgeable about financial matters, therefore his opinions about annuities are true. Once again, his background has nothing to do with the truth of his conclusions. We have to evaluate them on their own merits. And the primary reason for this is, plainly, experts can be wrong. In this Smithsonian Magazine's rather remarkable title, experts are almost always wrong. I don't know that I would go that far, but number four, Hegna's claims don't depend on his say-so. He's appealing to sources, so we don't have to worry about Hegna's expertise here or worry about whether he's a nice guy or a scoundrel. It's simply irrelevant. And according to Hegna, he bases his conclusions on the research of PhDs. And what he does, in his own words, is to translate that work into English so that people can understand it. And he's repeatedly stated that he reads hundreds of white papers written by PhDs all over the world. And he's forthright. He says, I am not an academic, but I read their writings and I wouldn't be where I am without them. Since Hegna isn't presenting us with his own original research or novel conclusions, this actually opens up an avenue for evaluation. We can poll his sources to see whether they think he has used them correctly. Polling sources won't guarantee their correctness. People can accurately quote something false, but it's a start. And frankly, if Hegna's sources complain that he's twisting them, then this undermines the entire support structure for Hegna's claims. Now, his sources fall into two basic categories, popular sources and academic sources. Now, even though popular sources are accessible, they're also journalistic. And what I mean by that is they tend to write in a very simple manner to try to appeal to a wide audience and to be accessible to that audience. They're often light on citations, and sometimes the reasoning is a little bit loose at the joints. Academic writing is more rigorous in theory, so some of their conclusions are a bit more tightly argued. And in addition to that, a lot of popular sources draw their information from academic sources. So I'm going to focus here on the academic sources. I'll cover popular popular ones in a different video. Now, some of the people he mentions are people like Dr. David Babel, Dr. Robert Merton, Dr. Moshe Malevsky, and Dr. Menachem Yari. Elsewhere, he's also mentioned Dr. Michael Fink and Dr. Wade Fow. We'll start with Drs. Michael Fink and Wade Fow. Drs. Fink and Fow wrote a paper for Principal Financial titled, It's More Than Money. And in that paper, they basically make the point, according to Hegna, that not only do income annuities provide income that can't be outlived, they give clients peace of mind. And if you go right to it's more than money, you can find the very quotation. It's about more than money. Income annuities provide income that can't be outlived. They give peace of mind. This research concludes that a combination approach using income annuities can help better meet goals in retirement than an investments only approach. Then they even provide a statistical analysis. And this comports with at least Fow's approach on his own for he includes deferred income annuities amongst the broad range of retirement income strategies that he advises for a happy retirement. When I asked Dr. Fink about his opinion of Hegna, he wrote to me and he said, Tom Hegna is correct in saying that the academic consensus is that no financial product is more efficient at producing income in retirement than an income annuity. He added that he also thinks that Tom's critique of advisors who don't use annuities is sound. And Dr. Fowl expressed essentially the same point when he wrote to me and said, I do agree with Hegna's basic message, other than possibly adding a few caveats about how everyone's situation is different and so forth. I don't have any issues with how Hegna expresses things. Menachem Yari and Robert Merton did not respond to me. I think both of them have now retired and it's not clear whether they're checking their email. 
but we can look at Dr. Moshe Maletsky. Maletsky, in answering my question as to what he thought about Tom Hegna's use of his work, said, quote, given what I have heard and read of his work, there is nothing I have come across that I can quibble with, disagree with, or object to. He's on the right track, and in particular with regards to the importance of longevity insurance and annuities in retirement. So yes, on that, there really is consensus among academic economists. Now, Dr. David Babel was the holdout of the six I wrote to and the four who responded. He was the one who had the most guarded appraisal. He wrote, quote, as was evident to me in reading Tom Hegna's book, he has deep knowledge about some things, casual knowledge about some things, and little knowledge or misconceptions about other things, as is probably the case with all of us. Now, I'm not sure what book he had in mind, but when I pressed him about an example of this, he wrote back and said, Hegna's retirement strategies are inadequate to protect against a loss of value in the dollar and also don't hedge against your personal inflation rate. I gave Tom Hegna an opportunity to respond to this, and Tom Hegna wrote back to me and said, I talk about inflation in every single talk I give. I say you can't just have income for life, you have to have increasing income for life, and I explain the three major ways to do it. Tom Hegna's three anti-inflation strategies, number one, you can buy multiple income annuities and ladder them. And then he says, once you cover your basic living expenses with guaranteed lifetime income, that's GLI, then you can optimize the rest of your portfolio to protect against inflation. And he gets into that, I'm sure, in his Retire Happy book. And finally, he says you can buy an income annuity with an inflation rider. Who's correct? I don't know. It's worth pointing out that Dr. Babel, according to his own plan, concentrates on what he refers to as TIPS, Tips and Stable Value Funds, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, and Stable Value Funds, which are popular because they have low risk. However, Dr. Babel still recommends deferred fixed annuities and immediate annuities in his overall approach to addressing and balancing retirement risks. So it's not clear that Hegna's approach is that far off from Dr. Babel's. So how can we take stock of the situation? There are several caveats. Firstly, not all annuities are equal. In his Annuity Fables, Some Observations from an Ivory Tower, Moshe Malevsky points out that when an academic financial economist talks about the benefits of annuities, he or she is likely referring to a very simple product, a product with which you get no return on your principal, but the payments last as long as you live. That could be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, or even 100 years. And so later in the article, he points out the word annuity is meaningless. It's perhaps no different from the word fund. Ask the question, do you like funds or do you own any funds? A reasonable reply will be, well, what sort of funds do you have in mind? Hedge funds, venture capital funds, private equity funds, exchange traded funds, mutual funds. The word annuity is just as vexed as the word funds. There are life annuities, term certain annuities, fixed annuities, variable annuities, immediate annuities, and deferred annuities. Not all annuities are annuities. He says, don't stop at the word annuity, dig deeper. Products, according to Dr. Michael Fink, that academics like the most are simple income annuities. Many annuities aren't necessarily designed to maximize the benefits of annuitization and can be expensive and confusing. It's clear from some of Tom Hegna's other writings that the income annuity he has in mind is the single premium immediate annuity. So number two, you have to watch the language. Don't get hung up on rhetoric whether it's in favor of annuities or against it. Malevsky again makes this point when he writes, take the time to acquaint yourself with the science, not the marketing. Dr. Fowle says, quote, I have met Tom Hagna a few times and I understand about him sounding like a salesperson. He probably expresses things a bit stronger than I would. And Dr. Malevsky again writes, sure, his presentations are a bit over the top and like any great communicator, he tends to embellish and exaggerate here and there. Taken out of context, I'm sure some of the proclamations can sound like he's selling snake oil. Remember, Malevsky was the one who said that Hegna's on the right track. One example of how Hegna may exaggerate just a bit is when he writes that optimal means best more often than anything else and that it will never be the worst. Never. Well, never say never. Which brings us to the question, how guaranteed is guaranteed? What happens if your insurance company goes out of business? Are you going to get your annuity payment then? Penn Treaty did it. AIG had to be bailed out in 2008, so it's not unheard of. So just how guaranteed is guaranteed? 
Although it's not unfair to ask the question, we should recognize that it applies equally to pensions and Social Security. For, as Investopedia points out, there are at least three ways you could lose your pension, and the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation faces insolvency issues. Additionally, there are ongoing concerns about the solvency of Social Security, with some people arguing that its retiree benefits could be depleted by 2034. And also, in fairness, some academics, like Malevsky, have written in some ways that can be fairly interpreted as a guarantee. So Malevsky describes the way an annuity works by saying, in part, the insurance company has to make payments to you forever. One final pitfall is what is sometimes termed the Mott and Bailey fallacy. The rather obscure reference is to a particular style of castle with a two-tiered construction, and it designates a particular reasoning error. In the usual case, a single arguer advances an easily defensible claim and then illicitly segues into a more controversial one. Alternatively, a person might start with a questionable assertion and then, when challenged, retreat into a more obvious claim instead. Now, what I have in mind is related but slightly different. So instead of applying to a single arguer, picture this. An agent from Acme Insurance Company calls you and invites you to watch a Tom Hegner presentation, whether in person or online, doesn't matter. And you attend and you're impressed. And Hegna convinces you that you need guaranteed lifetime income in your portfolio. And indeed, he convinces you that income annuities are well worth looking into as a possible source of that guaranteed lifetime income. But in a subsequent meeting, the ACME agent proceeds as if Hegna's general advocacy of annuities is automatically an endorsement of ACME's annuities specifically. You should be on your guard because it isn't. Acme's annuities might be perfectly good for you. They might be great, but the Acme agent will have to go beyond gesturing to Tom Hegna in order to show that Acme annuities are great. For all you know, simply going by Hegna's points, Acme may be a low-rated company and its products might be loaded with fees and surrender charges that make them ill-advised or undesirable purchases. Gecko and company annuities might be better for your situation, so be careful. But at the end of the day, it is certainly defensible that annuities have a deserved place in retirement portfolios. And I was surprised at how much agreement there really was on this point. The White Coat Investor, for example, writing in his article, Product Allocation, writes that, quote, everyone still agrees that purchasing a SPIA, that is a single premium immediate annuity, especially an inflation adjusted one, is a good idea for most retirees, especially those without a pension or with barely enough to support the desired lifestyle. And this is what Dr. Fink had said earlier. He said, Tom Hegna is correct in saying that the academic consensus is that no financial product is more efficient at producing income in retirement than an income annuity. The academic consensus, that is remarkable. Again, Moshe Malevsky, his observation number seven in the article that I quoted from earlier is titled, True Annuities Have Many Academic Fans. And he gives an annuity reading list for people who want to find out more. So at the end of the day, Tom Hegna certainly has a defensible set of claims. Whether the strategies are right for you, only you in conjunction with a conversation with a trusted advisor will be able to determine. But is it a scam? Absolutely not. Thank you so much for being with me. I hope that something that I said was of interest to you or value to you. If you think that it was, I ask that you like the video, click the subscription button, click the notification bell to be alerted to new content as it becomes available. I thank you so much for being with me today, and I look forward to seeing you again in another video. Thank you so much.